No, Cookie, Hanukkah is not a plot by Jewish people to steal your Christmas. Oh, hey, everybody, just talking to Cookie, Kentucky transplant and general head case. Guys, it's December. It's a perfect time to buy gifts for people, and if those people read, then congratulations. Uh, sometimes you buy books for a loved one, and they just sit on a shelf, even though they are uh, on topics you thought the person would be interested in, and they just become coasters and paperweights, and uh, you learn a hard lesson about gift giving in your own home with your own director of photography. But anyway, this is a happy occasion because if you are into buying books and want to buy something for a loved one, or just somebody you don't care that much about, but they like reading a lot, um, I have a recommendation for you today. It's buy one of the books I've reviewed the last year. What did you think I was going to say? Um, before we get to today's book review, we obviously have a sponsor, a usual the beverage of the month. And uh, this week's beverage, lemonade. As the comedian Sarah Silverman said, when life gives you AIDS, make lemonades. Uh, we are reviewing Path Lit by Lightning, the Jim Thorpe biography by David Moranis, or Marinus. Uh, and if that name sounds familiar, congratulations, nine people who've been watching these. He actually reviewed the, he wrote, I reviewed, he wrote, gotcha, the uh, Roberto Clemente biography that I gushed about earlier this year. So when I saw he had a new biography getting very good reviews, I said, let me get that. And I bumped it up my five-year waiting list of books that I've accumulated and haven't gotten to, and I said, let's do this one this year. Um, obviously, this is Jim Thorpe, who looks sort of like a First Nations John Cena. Um, we'll get to this book in a second, but I had a fun thing happen today, if you don't mind me sharing with you. You don't have a choice in the matter. Um, I was leaving church this morning, and two teenagers came up to me, uh, two black, well, Black teenagers, um, I hope I'm not doing the thing that cops do, where it's like the black teen approached me and it's like a three-year-old. And it's like, he was a black man. He was 11, sir. Anyway, kid was about 14, 13, I'd say 14, and his younger sister. And they said, are you the Trump impersonator? And I said, I am. I am the Trump impersonator, like Megan the Stallion. I am JL the Trump impersonator. And they said... Oh, I was, trying to, I was trying to look you up all the time in Mass. And I said, stop right there, young man. You were in the house of the Lord. Am I one of his most favorite sons? Sure. But in the house of the Lord, you should not be surfing the internet. You should be worshiping the one true God, not a comedy God, during Mass. So I thought that was a good opportunity to do some spiritual counseling. But then I said, J.L. Coven. He said, oh, I thought your name was J.J. And I said, is that, what, is that what's been killing me this whole time? There's millions of people in America going to see J.J. Covan at comedy clubs? Interesting. But he said, you, I think you met our dad in a Starbucks uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I said, young man, what two consenting anonymous males do in the bathroom of a Starbucks is their business. And then I realized they were talking about another man that I had talked to who had taken a selfie and said he was a huge fan of all my videos. And I said, oh, forget what I just said. Have a blessed Sunday. So that was my Sunday. And then I said to the righteous girlfriend, uh, non-fan of books, but fan of me sometimes and director of photography, I said, let's do a book review. It's time. The people, the people, I don't know if they want it, but they paid for it. So let's do this. So as you can see, Pathlet by Lightning is a thick book. T-H-I-C-C, -C, as the kids would spell it. And it's about Jim Thorpe, uh, who is a five-eighths Native American, the way I'm three-eighths black. So you got me, Jim Thorpe. You're more POC than me. But he was sort of America's first great athlete. He is um, kind of had some rugged, some rugged good looks, uh, but was uh, an Olympian, uh, sort of the first great football star in American history, played professional baseball for many years, um, just a real sort of Bo Jackson before Bo Jackson. And was it's it, it, the thing about this book, and unlike Clemente, Clemente, I sped through, I loved Clemente. I thought it was just a, a great read. 
And I actually like felt emotion when reading about his, the tragedy and the needless tragedy of Clemente's uh, early death. But that book didn't require, I think, as much history and information because it was, even though, yes, there was plenty of background about Clemente's life, I feel like Moranis or Marinus, uh, I think he thought this book was an opportunity, as it was, to sort of talk about the some of the history, 20th century history, late 19th century and early 20th century history of Native Americans in this country. So he does a really good job of sort of giving you this, fair, not too broad, because he doesn't just talk about Native Americans in, in, in the history of North America, but as it relates to Jim Thorpe's life, different laws that were passed. Uh, another book I read, didn't review for you guys, but also um, involved, uh, oh, coincidentally, he was, he was an Oklahoman, it involved, it was Killers of the, of the Moon, Killers of the Flower Moon, some shum native shit like that. Um, no, kidding. See, God, that was me being humorous, like humorously, ironically dismissing Native American things while praising Native Americans. That was just... Um, but it was a well-reviewed movie. I think it's probably in production or somebody has, a, has, has the rights to make it. Incredible book. And it, you know, what you see in this country and that Moranis or Marinus covers so well is the way Native American people were treated in this country versus the way black people were treated. Like Native Americans, I think even though they were slaughtered and, and treated horribly, I think the, the mythology and narrative in many ways was that like, Native Americans were like noble warriors that the white man vanquished in combat. So there's a, there's a different sensibility of like, oh, out of respect, yes, we slaughtered your people, but in, in a fair fight, and many of you were noble warriors just outdone by a superior race and better technology, but we, we see your nobility. I see you in a sort of progressive sense with racist connotations, and we want to make you better. So there's this you know, the school that Jim Thorpe goes to in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, was this sort of benign racist institution of like, we want to make you less Indian. We want to make you more American. We want to help you. We see that you have things to offer and we want to, we want to make you more in the mold of the white man. And whereas contrast that with, and there are stories in this book of how blacks and blacks and black athletes were treated. And I think it goes to the sort of level of guilt. Whereas with Native Americans, it was like, well, we beat you horribly and viciously and violently and cruelly in war, but you are warriors. So we want to bring you in almost as domesticated pets. And I, I'm, there's, there's sort of that indication. That's the kind of tone. Whereas with descendants of slaves and black people, it's more of an overwhelming guilt of like, well, we never treated you like people. So we don't want you anywhere near us. Like, so there is... I, I would say in the hierarchy, you see a difference in terms of, uh, you know, Jim Thorpe and his fellow Native athletes were not forced to be in segregated situations the way black athletes were. So just even that context, I'm, I'm telling you all this because it's such a, the reason it's such a thick THICC book is because it's providing a lot of context in terms of the history of, of Native Americans. And what that book, Killers of the Flower Moon, um, talks about is how... They kept shoving Native Americans. It was like, uh, we want to take this land now, so be gone. And then they end up settling a lot of them in Oklahoma. Well, it turns out Oklahoma, unbeknownst to the white man, had tons of oil. And then these Native Americans were like, uh, I guess we're rich now. Ha ha. Well, then the government basically passed these laws where it's like, oh, well, you know, you're so simple, Native American people, that you have to... Uh, you own the land, but we have to manage your money. And we have to, it's like insane stuff. Yes, is that preferable to Jim Crow lynching? Of course. But in a weird way, it's like this bizarre, like, 100 years ago, Native Americans who were rich by the bad, the stupidity and racism of, of white people, it was like, oh, uh, I have like, millions of dollars of 1910s wealth under my feet. Well, you know, you probably need help managing that. So we're going to pay you an allowance. And it's, so Killers of the Flower Moon as a companion book to this. It has nothing to do with Jim Thorpe, but it's also Oklahoma racism, this, this, this domesticated animal treatment 
that white people did. So the point is this book goes through so much through Jim Thorpe's life of explaining different struggles that Native Americans have had and their mistreatment. And then the press clippings, it's always, it's very, when Jeremy Lynn, pardon my language, when, Jerry, when Lynn Sanity was going on, um, the, 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 the Chinese American basketball player for the New York Knicks who took the league by storm one month, I forget what year, pardon me, was it 2012 maybe? Um, then an ESPN writer, when Lynn had a bad game, wrote chink in the armor <sighs> if it was the onion hilarious espn i i don't know what's worse if you didn't realize what you're doing or if you did realize what you're doing obviously it's worse if you realized what he was doing but um there's so many headlines in this book where it's like uh big chief savages army and football game and on the war path and you start to realize like all these things that people say now it's like who cares like they're not offended it's like so many of these things are rooted in this like ignorance or this like dismissive racism of like, oh, what well, these Indians? So like, you know, he scalped the opponents and and the, the, the tenor of so much is like he was just a Jim Thorpe seemed to have it all seemed to be pretty much all there. And but 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 like every excuse from him would be like, he was a simple man. He did not know the white man's customs. And it's like it's really bizarre when you're reading this stuff. Um but most importantly, I got the book because Jim Thorpe is this legendary sort of American athlete story. And I said, yeah, I want to read it. I want to learn about him. And boy, do you learn about him in, in so many ways. Um, I don't really know what to tell you other than I liked the book and found it. If you're not a big sports fan, but you're an American history fan, I think you'll like this book because it provides so much history about 20th century Native American life and treatment across the board in pop culture, news, government, sports, that like sports is just sort of what Jim Thorpe did for a living. Um, if you're a sports fan, I feel like it's a sort of an essential Mount Rushmore type athlete in American history. Um, so that said, uh, his story resonates with me because um, he ends up traveling the country broke. So I thought, we all have a little bit of Jim Thorpe in us, I guess. Um, it's a very bittersweet story. Uh, without giving away anything, it's just, it's one of those things where um, he always has this success and then it always seems to backfire on him. Um, so yes, I recommend it. Like, if you're ending the review now, yes, I recommend it. Go buy it. Uh, my method of purchase, I don't often talk about this, guys, but I'm not an Amazon guy. Um, I try not to support um, uh, big tech companies that suck, but please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and TikTok. Uh, but I usually, what I do is I order online from a Barnes and Noble for pickup, for store pickup. Now I don't drive because I'm somebody who cares about the environment. So I'll just walk to a nearby Barnes and Noble near work and pick it up. And then you get the internet price, but without the shipping, and without any of that stuff. So I think that's the best way to buy books. I don't buy from Amazon. I buy from Barnes and Noble, a mom and pop shop, and just pick it up. And I save, I get the internet savings while not contributing to waste and emissions. So I'm better than most of you is my point. Um, but if you do get this book, I wanna read one passage that really doesn't have to do with Jim Thorpe. It was just fascinating the lives he went across. He was an Olympian with, um, General Patton, when General Patton was obviously not General Patton, but just a punk ass bitch. Uh, and he also, he played football against Dwight Eisenhower when Carlisle, which was a school, as I said, for, for um, native peoples, uh, they played Army or West Point and beat them. And Dwight Eisenhower was on the other side. So Jim Thorpe's life really is like a, it's like a Forrest Gump minus the cognitive impairment and with more athletic ability. That's kind of his, his life um, and more racism. But I wanted to read this part and bear with me. It's like a two page thing on George Patton's Olympic time because uh, you just are like, oh, this is a bitch. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of, kind of fun. But um, the modern pentathlon, which was not like a five, like it was the modern pentathlon was like military 
kind of skills in the Olympics. So this is the 1912 Olympics where um, Jim Thorpe sets various records, um, like destroys everybody in the, in, the, in the decathlon. But the modern pentathlon was like military skills. This was an Olympic contest. Modern pentathlon had started by then with George S. Patton, the sole American in the competition. Five events over five days, said to replicate the skills of a 19th century cavalry, cavalry man. The first time the event was held in the modern Olympics. So I didn't have to explain it to you before. I forgot that David Marinus or Moranis uh, explained it. So that was, uh, we'll edit that out. We won't. You already know I didn't edit it out. In later accounts of that week, including his report to superiors, Patton exaggerated his performance in four events. Military hero. Um, provide an excuse in one that none of the judges bought. Bitch. And for the fifth, rationalized his collapse by confessing to the use of a performance-enhancing drug that was legal then but later outlawed. This is our big military hero, a total bitch and cheat. Anyway, thank you for your service. Um, in the first event, pistol shooting from 25 meters, Patton used his U.S. Army issue 38 Colt Special. He fired 20 bullets. The judge, judges found only 17 holes in the target. He said that was because the other three bullets perfectly pierced existing holes. What do you think this is, a Disney movie, General Patton? The judges said no. In later reports, Patton said he scored 11 bullseyes, while the official report said he had four, with eight near bullseyes. In any case, the first event found him in 20th place. Next came a 300-meter swim. He finished seventh, so exhausted he had to be helped from the outdoor pool. Now, at this point, I like what David Marinus is doing, because he's lifting up Jim Thorpe's story as an American hero, giving him the proper, full biography he deserves, but also... Not so subtly being like, oh, and by the way, uh, some of your white heroes were total bitch asses. Um, I almost went into a Ron Reagan Jr. impression, which I assume some of you listen to the Righteous Burke podcast. Hey guys, we had a technical difficulty there. The cartridge was full because I make so much content. So now we're back. Hopefully we added out the cinematographer's voice going, wait, pause, stop. Um... Next came a... Th I'm sorry if I'm repeating this. Who gives a shit? Nobody's watching anymore. Uh, he finished seventh, so exhausted he had to be helped from the outdoor pool. What a bitch. For some reason, he later said he came in sixth. No wonder Trump loved Patton. The guy was full of shit. Um, he finished... Uh, the third event was fencing, one of his strengths, on the courts of the Royal Swedish Tennis Club. He finished fourth, but later said it was third while also claiming he won his match against the eventual winner, Frenchman Georges Brulé. He did win that match, but Brulé, in fact, finished eighth. Why would Patton make this claim? Because he thought that would make him look better, according to Rusty Wilson, an Olympic historian at Ohio State. He viewed the French as the best swordsman. The fourth event was the 3,000-meter steeplechase. Patton was an expert rider. He had participated in several steeplechases that year and was a member of the Fort Myer polo team. But fencing girl, his horse, was injured, so he had to ride a horse provided by the Swedes, and he came in fourth. The final event was the 4,000-meter cross-country run in which the competitors started in the stadium, lined up below the royal box, which is where the royals sit. It's not referring to the princess's private parts then ran a third of the way around the track and out the stadium tunnel onto a course that took them up a hill, into a forest, through a swamp, and back to the stadium. Of our own Lieutenant George S. Patton Jr., the Los Angeles Herald examiner wrote, this tall, slim, fair man took the regulation sprinter's start and undoubtedly took too much out of himself in the early going. He appeared well spent when he re-entered the stadium, and though he had a lead of 50 yards, Lieutenant Patton stopped almost to a walk as a Swede brushed by, and when the American finished, he dropped into a faint. And here comes Marinus just, just dropping haymakers on Patton. That account underplays what happened. Before the race, Patton was given a strong dose of hop by Coach Murphy. Hop was another word for opium. It was legal then before the banning of performance-enhancing drugs and was meant to get him to run like hell, but it could also be dangerous, especially on a day as hot as July 12th, 
when temperatures soared into the 90s. The scene of Patton re-entering the stadium at race's end was startling as he came through the tunnel in the lead and then reeled, wobbled, staggered, and almost fell, slowed to a walk, was passed by Swedish runner Gustav Asbrink. That sounded more German. I don't know how Swedes talk. But it's Gusta with the two eyeballs on top of the O. Umlaut, which is a good song by the German uh, Hansen. Umlaut, bop, 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 over your O's, bop, umlaut, mm. And utterly dehydrated, collapsed to the track as he crossed the finish line. As Patton later told the story, the trainer gave me some hop before the start. I fainted after finishing the race and was out for some hours. Once I came to, but could not move or open my eyes, I felt them give me a shot of more pop. I feared that it would be an overdose and kill me. Then I heard Papa say in a calm voice, Will the boy live? And Murphy reply, I think he will, but can't tell. And Marinus just goes on to tell more, like more, that George S. Patton is just a whole ass liar. He does, not his words, those are mine. But that's an example of what Marinus did. I don't want to spoil any of the Jim Thorpe stuff. Obviously, the book's about Jim Thorpe. But the reason I found that funny is that Marinus, what he does throughout the book, is kind of expose all the more high profile, successful white people around Jim Thorpe as basically full of shit. And it's just, it's, it's, like I said, it's a big book. It's, I think, 570 pages. I never, I don't count, like, the index and stuff. You know, when you read on Barnes & Noble or Amazon, it'll be, like, 700 pages. I'm like, yeah, but, like, a hundred of that is bibliography and index. I don't read that shit. So, um, it's, it's worth, it's worth reading. Um, I enjoyed it. If I was going to say, was it as enjoyable as Clemente? No. But it's doing sort of more of a dual history, it's doing a history and biography kind of job in one, which is why it's such a thick THICC book. And by the way, two weeks after I began this book, the New York Times decided to put it on their 100 notable books of 2022. So once again, the JL book bump is real. So that's your review for this month. Hopefully the edits were done fairly smoothly. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I think it was one of my best book reviews ever, really. And who knows how many more of these we have to go because my special will be out soon. And by soon, I mean sometime in the next calendar year. And then I just have to reevaluate what I'm doing with my life. And as much as I love reading books and then giving humorous, really top tier book review content to 11 of you, I don't know if that's worth continuing. So stay tuned. Will books end in 2023? Wouldn't that be the jail jinx? It's like, Oh, it turns out um, we can't make books anymore because J.O. got too many views on his book reviews. So books are now not allowed. Anywho, next month, guys, will be Music Book Month. The first annual Music Book Month, probably the last. But I'll be reviewing two music biographies for you in January. The first, which I've started, is Surrender by Boner, the U2 frontman. Just kidding, Bono. I'm liking it so far. Um, little teaser, all I'll tell you is that 130 pages into it, my most common thing other than going, I'm enjoying this, is, oh, that's what the fuck he means in that song. One of my favorite groups ever. I have more U2 albums than any musical group on the planet, and I'm learning what the hell these melodic good songs mean. It's like, oh, that's about his father? Okay. That's about your mom? Oh, oh that's about where you lived. Didn't know. Sounded like you were rambling with some good music in the background, but now I know that he's much more poet than songwriter, and I don't mean that pretentiously. I know if you know me, you're probably thinking J.L. probably hates poetry, and you're right. Amanda Gorman couldn't give a shit about her poem during uh, Biden's inauguration. Really couldn't, and most of you were lying when you were like, oh, her poem, shut up, you don't like poetry. Anyway, uh, the other one, George Michael, A Life, which I thought was about the son on Arrested Development. Turns out there was also a singer uh, named George Michael. So I'll be reading this. And uh, just if you see the picture, uh, not saying he was a hairy, mature-looking Greek, but this was George Michael at nine years old. So I'm excited to read this and about his overactive pituitary or whatever the hell made him such a handsome, hairy uh, gay king, but uh, not to be confused with Gail King, who is Oprah's best friend. Maybe I'll read a, a book by her one day. Uh, anyway, guys, I had fun doing this. I hope three of you enjoyed it, 
and uh, next next month we'll be doing music bios. So have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, a Happy Kwanzaa, and uh, whatever else you do during the holidays. And I will see you with more books in 2023. Bye!